Welcome to the video. Today I'm going to do another random selection from my collection. And my my LPs are all organized in alphabetical order. And in this particular room in the house, um, I've stuffed as many in as I possibly can. And there are other, elsewhere, there are other uh, shelves full of alphabetically ordered LPs as well. But today I'm going to pick one, so one area um, Probably around the um, the the J to uh, to L, yeah, J to L section. Pick half a dozen LPs, and then uh, have a listen, and then talk about them. Okay, so here we go. Just as usual, I'm gonna not look, just see what happens. You get a sneak peek before I do. Sorry, but it's okay. Last one, I think. There we go. Okay, so, give them a listen, talk about them. I have this friend of mine back home who uh, is been a bit of a music nut as well over the years and uh, one of the things that he did several years ago maybe longer than several years ago is that he decided that what he was going to do he was going to play his records from A through to Z every single one he was going to play in order whether he'd listened to it the previous week or he hadn't listened to it in years he was just going to go through with that and I thought that's such a good idea uh, because over the years I've collected so many records that I, this, as viewers of previous videos will know that I haven't always got around to listening to yet. Um, but there are too many records and too many CDs to go through A to Z. I'd probably have to live to 100. Uh, so I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just pluck from the shelves uh, a selection of, like a random pick of, of records. And, um, you know, Firstly, I'll, I'll do it to, um, you know, maybe talk about, try and reflect on them, kind of remind myself what's in this collection. Um, uh, but then I found I started to make a few of these videos of random selections. There were uncomfortably too many that I hadn't even listened to. So I thought, well, what I'll do this time, I will pluck half a dozen albums from the collection. And before I talk about them on video, I'll actually listen to them. Um, so here we go. So these are the ones I've picked. The first one is by The Jam. And this is live at Newcastle City Hall from the 28th of October, 1980. I think this is a limited edition of about 1,000 or 1,500, possibly available uh, through the band's website or maybe of some other, other distributor. But this is really, really good. Now, I saw the jam several times um, during this period from, you know, 1977 through to the early 1980s, mostly at Newcastle City Hall, Newcastle Mayfair, and some old cattle market in Carlisle one time. And I used to take my younger brothers who weren't old enough to go to gigs themselves at the time. And uh, one of them in particular, still a rabid Paul Weller fan after all these years, uh, even, uh, tries to emulate his kind of mod credentials and his fashion sense. Um, but this album, I mean, it just I just plucked this out. I found this um, in an envelope uh, recently. It's a ticket from, uh, is it the year before? Yes, yeah, the year before this was recorded. So I think I was probably at one of these gigs. I think they did two gigs in 1980. Um, but but great. I mean, there's some great, great tracks on this, on this album. Um, Thick as Thieves, Boy About Town, Going Underground, Pretty Green, of course. Well, those of you who know Taxman by the Beatles will will uh, chuckle at Pretty Green. Uh, Man in the Corner Shop, Private Hell, uh, This is the Modern World from their second album. 
um, Star, Strange Town, Eaton Rifles down in the tube station at midnight. Uh, a bomb in Wardour Street. David Watts, of course, closes the album. Uh, really good, high energy. When I listened to that again, I, I was quite surprised at how kind of competent Paul Weller was on the guitar. I'd never thought him as a, a, a great guitarist, and I still don't. But there's just three guys on stage, and they're really hammering away here for a good hour and a half. Um, really good and a very varied sound as well so i was really well impressed i've been a bit of a fan of paul weller over the years not um not as keen obviously as uh, as my brother but i quite like some of the style council stuff his solo stuff is kind of a bit of a mixed bag but always worth a listen i never considered him a really authentic singer i found him much better when he uh singing in very angry energetic style as in the days of the jam since then I, I think he's a unconvincing crooner at times um but fair dues he's still going he's been around for such a long time and a real credit um one great memory i've got of the jam at the city hall is um one time they played in the city from the first album and the vocal pa uh, stopped working and while the the roadies were frantically trying to fix things the band just had a run through of the uh, the instrumental version of it were of it, of, of, as it were and uh, 2000 people in the city hall sang all the lyrics from beginning to end it was such a thrill it was really really good so the jam not my favorite band but really enjoyed them back in the day uh, the second album i picked out this time is richard jobson's bad man uh, remember the skids new wavy band had Richard Jobson and um, and Stuart Adamson, <laughs> momentarily forgot Stuart Adamson, who formed, of course, the um, oh, hang on, what? <laughs> Big Country, Big Country. See, my memory's failing me. But there you go. Yeah, formed Big Country. Great guitarist as well. Very distinctive sound. Very, uh, very well known for his uh, kind of bagpipe sounding guitar. It's really, really good. Um, Jobson, um, this album is kind of very much of its time. I think it's around 1988 or something like that. And it's it's produced by, um, or at least some of the tracks are produced by Ian Broody, who, uh, who led the Lightning Seeds. Um, but it's kind of a bit undistinguished, really. And I think part of it is, um, part of it's because Richard Jobson at the time was beginning to build a portfolio career kind of a TV presenter type, uh, maybe a bit of a port, maybe a bit of acting. And it, it, the whole album, listening to it again, feels like um, um, like he's not really committed to a music career, that it wasn't necessarily um, necessary for this to be supremely successful, or at least successful along the lines of uh, the way the skids were, for example. Um, but yeah, it's okay, it's kind of a, an fairly easy listen but it's uh, nothing special uh talking of nothing special um quincy jones sounds and stuff like that now this was i'm trying to think it i think this was before he released uh the dude which uh, which came along and that had the fantastic opener i know Carita, and it was before he was working with uh, michael jackson and he'd been around for a hell of a long time before this album was released, uh, doing jazz. Um, but here, this is much more of a funky soul offering. Um, he does a good version of Stevie Wonder's Superwoman, uh, taking it to the streets by the Doobie Brothers, Michael McDonald's song, uh, great as well. Stuff like that was a lead-off uh, single, uh, opens the album. Uh, he's got people like Luther Vandross on it, um, Gwen Guthrie, uh, a couple of other well-known female singers as well it's kind of pleasant but not necessarily really special quincy jones uh, the dude is a good album um the legend the legend that is tom jones this is the 1970 album tom and those of you who've got an interest in tom jones or followed tom jones might have similar memories to me of the late 60s where he was doing tv specials frequently 
where he was had all these great dance moves, women throwing their knickers at him and so on and so forth. It was really hilarious. And then he went through this period in the 1980s where try you know 70s I think were a bit of a fallow patch for him, uh, fallow period. But the uh, the 80s he did a version of Prince's Kiss, um, and he did Sex Bomb as well, which you know the 80s stuff didn't didn't appeal at all. And then um, he did an album. I think it was produced by Van Morrison, but it certainly included three Van Morrison songs. Um, called Carrying a Torch, which is early 1990s, around the time of Van Morrison's Hymns to the Silence, um, which I think included exactly the same tracks uh, sung by the the, uh, the composer himself. Uh, and since then, he's kind of been um, producing more rootsy albums. Uh, Praise and Blame is one of a few years ago, which is really good. More, more rootsy, bluesy, um, Southern States Amer uh, Americana type thing, and he sounds really, really convincing. And anybody in the U UK who occasionally watches The Voice, he's 80 years old or something like that now, and occasionally he will be asked to belt out a bit of a song just to provide a bit of a variety of entertainment um, on the on the show, and he does a brilliant job. He's still got a fantastic voice. Uh, this particular album, uh, here we've got uh, a lot of classics here. So we've got Otis Redding's Can't Turn You Loose, uh, Tony Joe White's Pork Salad Annie, uh, John Fogarty from Credence, uh, Proud Mary, uh, A Thank You, which I think is by uh, Isaac Hayes, and then You've Lost That Love and Feeling and so on and so forth. Uh, side one is all rock and soul, and it's got like a Stax feel. Uh, not quite as punchy as Stax, but loads of Stax horns, uh, Stax style horns, and the, um, the kind of choppy guitar, Steve Cropper guitar, I think. Um, but it doesn't; it's not quite as, as as gutsy as I've suggested because I think there's still a bit of a legacy of his middle of the road years, and that comes to the fore in Side Two, where it's just basically all ballads. So that middle of the road. Um, kind of style of, of Tom Jones. I think probably the record company at the time thought uh, he wanted to do more gutsy music, uh, but his manager and the record company were saying, well, look, don't lose those middle of the road uh, fans who've been following your TV specials over the years. But yeah, Tom Jones, absolute legend and actually a surprisingly good album. Um, Mark Knopfler, The Prince's Bride. Now, Mark Knopfler, of course, Dire Straits. I remember seeing Dire Straits on the uh, the first tour they did in the UK. But I've always been a big fan of of Mark Knopfler. This, as I've suggested, is his fourth um, soundtrack album after Local Hero, Last Exit to Brooklyn, Cal, and I think he did some music for another film called Comfort and Joy. Maybe not a full album's worth. Uh, this one, it's all acoustic guitar with lush orchestration. Um, sounds very much like um, a Hollywood soundtrack album uh, whereas Local Hero and the theme Going Home the kind of the closing theme um, that particular track sounds like an instrumental dire straight tune um, but this one is very much about lush orchestration um, apart from the final track which is the which has the great Willie DeVille singing um, yeah, I should put my glasses on here um, there we go. Storybook Love, Storybook Love, which I think is on one of his albums in the in the late 1980s as well. This one I think from 1988. So this is uh, nowhere near a strong recommendation for Mark Knopfler, but I really like Mark Knopfler. I think he's a fantastic singer songwriter. And then finally, Ronnie Lane, Ronnie Lane's Slim Chance. Now Ronnie Lane, if you don't know him, was a member, the bass player in fact, of the Small Faces in the late 60s, then going on to join the Faces <coughs> with uh, Rod Stewart as the singer and Ronnie Wood as the lead guitarist. Uh, Ronnie Lane, um, kind of, he's got his vocal style, it's kind of a, like a, a kind of yearning really, he's kind of reaching um, for for the lyrics, um, but he's good, he, he, it, and the whole feel of this is kind of rootsy and forky. Um, 
So you've got mandolin, you've got accordion, uh, you know, acoustic, guitars, bit of piano, and the whole thing sounds really ramshackled. So I'm, I, 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 I'm sure that the live versions of these studio tracks sounded absolutely no different because you know live is always a bit more raw but this was as raw as it comes from the very off but it's a really nice folky rootsy feeling album and really good sound as well um he liked a bit of a drink so he was kind of and he had this kind of uh traveler gypsy kind of persona that um used to characterize his uh his stage presence um but yeah, a really good singer. I think he was co-wrote a lot of the Faces uh, tracks with, with Rod Stewart. So he was not just a singer and bass player. He's, uh, he's a pretty accomplished songwriter as well. Um, he sadly died aged about 50, 51 or something like that of multiple sclerosis, which was diagnosed, um, I think, around the time he did an album with Pete Townsend from The Who called Rough Mix, which I really love as well. It's a really good blend of of kind of rock and this folky rootsy feel but yeah ronnie lane uh good album one of three or four that he did definitely worth picking up so that's my random selection today uh hopefully uh you'll be inspired to uh to have a bit of a dig yourself um maybe you'll recognize or know some of those albums already but as i say that's it for today i'll pick another random selection sometime in due course thanks for watching i'll see you later Bye.